Ascension Island is located 1,000 miles from Africa and 1,400 miles from Brazil at 7 degrees south, 14 degrees west. The remote 36 square mile island has a population of around 800 people, mostly contractors for the U.S. Air Force or British Royal Air Force. Both military bases played an important role during World War II. Since Ascension boasts the second longest runway in the world, which can be used for emergency space shuttle landings, NASA currently has a tracking station on the island. This station was the first to receive Neil Armstrong's message, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The BBC also has a relay station on the island. Ascension was originally discovered in 1501 by Portuguese explorers. Voyagers continued to use the island as a source of fresh seabird and sea turtle meat. It remained uninhabited until 1815 when the British claimed it and established a military presence to keep the French away when Napoleon was exiled on St. Helena Island, 800 miles to the southeast. Charles Darwin visited in 1836 as part of his voyage on the HMS Beagle. In an effort to bring fresh water to the island, he, along with Joseph Hooker, introduced a number of non-native species to create a man-made cloud forest, now called Green Mountain. These exotic species spread and displaced the seven endemic plant species. One plant is now so endangered there are only six plants remaining in the wild. The Ascension Island Conservation Department has an office on Green Mountain where they're cultivating the endemic plants in greenhouses and attempting to introduce them back into the wild. There are also three endemic invertebrate species found exclusively in the tide pools on the island, including two shrimp and a bubble-like green algae. Ascension is also home to one endemic vertebrate species, the Ascension Island frigate bird. Years of colonization brought rabbits, rats, and feral donkeys to the island, all contributing to the spread of invasive species. Perhaps most notably, Ascension is host to the second largest green turtle nesting population in the Atlantic. These turtles forage off the coast of Brazil for six months before making the long migration to Ascension Island to mate and nest. The 2014 Duke University Sea Turtle Biology and Conservation class was the first of its kind. For 10 days, we worked alongside conservation staff to learn about the current challenges and future of conservation on Ascension Island. As part of my first postdoc, um, Annette and I, and that's Annette Project, and I came as a job sharing couple, both of us as postdocs straight out of our PhDs, to run a project which was funded by the British government to set up turtle conservation and monitoring on the island. So at that point in time there was no um, conservation department and um, it was uh, it was very interesting time because people wanted to get become involved and we ended up with 40 or 50 people involved in the turtle research. And about a year and a half later the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds launched a program to eradicate the feral cats to help do restoration ecology for seabirds and so at that point a conservation department was formed and we've been working very closely with that conservation department through successive conservation officers through a series of projects to do sea turtle conservation and research but more recently to in another Darwin project um, this time coordinated by Annette and I but run by the, um, the conservation department here to do a biodiversity action plan for the whole of Ascension Island. The island is home to a land crab that is native only to Ascension Island and three other small South Atlantic islands. Growing to a carapace width of 4.3 inches, it remained the largest land animal until cats, rabbits, sheep, rats, and donkeys were introduced in the 19th century. Following colonization, land crab populations were devastated and have struggled to recover. From January to March, there is an annual spawning migration from the moist, vegetated slopes of Green Mountain to the arid, rocky coastline. Although juvenile and adult land crabs are terrestrial, their planktonic larvae are released into the sea at the end of the migration. Zipping around, they're all land crab larvae. They're so Ooh. tiny. Yeah, so let me, if everyone but one kills their lights, so, so it's just in one direction, you'll see them, they'll all gather in the lit corner. So we're all going to head over here now. So that happens in about 20 seconds of them being in the wash, they're all ready to go when the female lays them. At the peak of spawning season, hundreds of land crabs can be seen dropping their larvae into the waters of Northeast Bay. These land crabs are one of several endemic species on Ascension Island.
The introduction of mammal predators during colonization resulted in rapid declines in seabird nesting. Populations fell from 20 million to 11,000 in only 150 years. In 2002, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds funded a feral cat eradication program, and the island was declared cat-free in 2006. We host the most important uh, breeding populations of tropical seabirds in the South Atlantic, including the endemic Ascension Island frigate bird, um, which has only recently, probably in the first time in 150 to 200 years, started nesting back on the mainland again, which is a really great result, which means that since the cat eradication, not only have the, the, the boobies and the terns started nesting in greater numbers, but also the frigate birds. And hopefully in maybe 10 or 20 years, we'll start to see the population of this endangered species starting to increase. Because on Bosun Bird Island, the offshore island where, which was the last real haven for all the nesting seabirds, the nesting sites are saturated. And so there's nowhere else for them to breed. So hopefully over the next few years we'll start to see more and more nesting on the mainland and can the RSPB and the Ascension Island Conservation Department can claim a real great success with regard to the, the cat eradication and the restoration for seabirds. My name is Emily Cunningham and I'm the Marine Turtle Programme Coordinator for this season along with Daniel Moore. We have two interns in well called Maria and Maddy. Uh, myself and Daniel both went to Brown University and did marine biology. After that I went and worked with the UK Government Environment Agency and did environmental management. Then I found myself in Sri Lanka with marine turtles and that's led me to work here. Our job here is mostly monitoring, so we monitor the beaches, we count tracks and the nests and from that we can determine the nesting success on the beach on any given night. We have three study sites, that's Long Beach, Pan Am Beach and North East Bay and we're looking at how the nesting success varies between those beaches. We check every morning for strandings because turtles aren't the most intelligent of animals and sometimes need a little helping hand getting back to the sea. We do a lot of night work where we're putting in loggers to measure the temperature of the nest over the incubation period as well. We're putting them in on all three nesting beaches, main nesting beaches, to see how it varies between those beaches as well. Um, within the community, everybody here is very respectful of the turtles. The people here, they're just part of everyday life. They know that the beaches, the children know when the hatchlings start to hatch and everything's very interesting goes down. But um, our one problem is potentially with tourists coming through not knowing that they shouldn't approach the turtle, touch the turtle, flash their white lights, take flash photography. So we're just working on a very small scale. So we do turtle tours so that it's in a controlled environment. And we also just put kind of guidelines around the island so that when people are just passing through, uh, through for a few days, they know how to behave around the turtle on the beach. We help the Conservation Office conduct research on nest incubation temperatures by placing data loggers into the middle of the nest while the turtle laid her eggs. Multiple loggers were placed on each beach to understand how temperature varies among the beaches. This research has important implications for how climate change might affect sea turtle sex ratio, since sex is determined by temperature during incubation. Warmer sand temperatures tend to yield more females, whereas cooler sand temperatures yield more males. In addition to this, we also measured carapace length and width of each successful nesting female. This must be done while she is laying because she is in a trance-like state and is less likely to be disturbed.
Once they finish laying, each turtle covers up their nests before going back to the water. On Ascension Island, it took around an hour for a female to dig, lay, and cover up her nest successfully. In other parts of the world, sea turtles are not afforded such a high levels of protection that allow them to nest virtually undisturbed. When we went to Sri Lanka, myself, Daniel and Maddie as well, we had a lot of different issues with turtles there. In Sri Lanka there's five species of turtles that nest on the beaches all around the island. And Sri Lanka is quite a good comparison to here because it's about the same uh, level north of the equator that we are south of the equator, so they're both about 7 degrees north or 7 degrees south. But Sri Lanka is a developing nation and it's had a lot of issues in the past 20-30 years to do with the civil war, so conservation has been suppressed somewhat compared to here. So, as you guys know, in Ascension there was huge levels of exploitation, but that stopped and now um, green turtles are afforded a really high level of protection on the island, so there is zero take, direct take or, um, of eggs, whereas in Sri Lanka on some beaches we are still looking at about 100% take of nested females and of eggs. So the market for eggs in Sri Lanka is for consumption, so they can get taken by the coastal fishermen to a middleman and then end up in the capital where people eat them, or they're taken for hatcheries, but these are branded conservation hatcheries and they're actually for tourists, so it's somewhat of a zoo. So those are the main issues. Um, in Sri Lanka there's still a lot of bycatch, and when working in conservation here, it's very streamlined. I work for the conservation department, but in Sri Lanka there's a lot of um, brown envelopes that have to be passed before you can work with the conservation department there. So in terms of, of how the sea turtle conservation varies, Ascension is utopia and Sri Lanka has got quite a long way to go. Occasionally the conservation staff conduct excavations of sea turtle nests that hatched two to four days prior. The purpose of these excavations is to collect data on clutch size and hatchling success. We recorded the number of hatched eggs, undeveloped egg yolks, and unhatched eggs with partial embryos, as well as measured the nest depth and location. Sometimes during excavations, staff are surprised to find live hatchlings trapped underneath eggshells in the nest. During this excavation, we found 40 live hatchlings in one nest and 12 in another. Because it was daylight, we kept every hatchling back and placed them in a bucket for a nighttime release. The reasoning behind waiting is to avoid the hatchlings being easily predated by frigate birds or large tuna or sharks waiting in the water. By waiting until the dark of night to emerge, hatchlings decrease their chances of becoming dinner. Had we released them in the morning, they almost certainly would not have survived. Up against overwhelming odds, waiting until dark will increase their chance of survival. So Ascension Island is probably the second largest green turtle nesting colony in the Atlantic after Tortuguero in Costa Rica and it was subject to very intense exploitation through the 19th century and the population likely declined to a fraction of what it was. Um, the exploitation declined from the 1930s and through the 1940s and ceased in the 1950s and no turtles have been, have been taken, uh, harvested since 1950. So the population was probably at a very low level by the 19. 40s and 50s, but they were protected at that point, and they probably started. It probably started to recover then, but in the 1980s, Projeto Tamar, which is a pan-national turtle conservation program in Brazil, where all the turtles live, started, and lots of conservation activities happened there. The harvest, large industrial harvests, were stopped, and so turtles were protected on the nesting ground and in the foraging grounds, and it appears the population is rising very fast and you know, at, at the level of maybe doubling every 10 years or something like that now. So there are far more turtles nesting now than there were when we began monitoring or when Jeannie Mortimer did her stuff in the 70s. Ascension Island is globally important for biodiversity. It has a small population, yet the government here is, is putting significant resources, multiple staff members and vehicles into conservation. But undoubtedly, because it's of global importance, it's important that the UK government and international conservation organisations continue to support these, this small band of very dedicated people because we're dealing with something of global importance. But things are getting better and great leaps have been made over the last decade to 15 years and it's quite exciting looking forward as to what the future of biodiversity is on Ascension Island. The reason I call Ascension Sea Turtle Utopia is because the threats are basically zero to turtles whilst they're on the island. During nesting there is 
no direct threat, the only threat is to themselves when they don't find their own way back to sea. Only about 30% of the energy transferred from the egg to the ecosystem actually comes in the form of a successful hatchling. Another 30% remains in the form of undeveloped eggs and the eggshells tossed back into the pit after excavation. These eggs or shells eventually decompose and deliver vital nutrients back into the sand. Another 30% is energy transferred to predators. While this course focused on turtles, we quickly came to realize how important conservation is to all of the species and ecosystems on Ascension Island. Through the protection of land crabs, the cat eradication to boost seabird nesting, and 35 years of sea turtle monitoring, the conservation staff and dedicated researchers worldwide have helped the populations rebound. This once in a lifetime opportunity made us appreciate the role such a small island can have in global biodiversity and we're excited to learn about future efforts and research on Ascension Island.